Hello and welcome to the New Life Online Bible School. So glad that you have joined us to this week also. Uh, and um, today we are continuing the topic of the Fireful Church. Uh, and, um, and we're going to uh, look at the new wineskins and why the Fireful Church is the new wineskins that Jesus is talking about. Uh, so, um, we can just lay the foundation uh, by uh, looking at uh, where Jesus is talking about new wineskins in uh, Luke chapter 5 and verse 36. And we read from verse 36 there, and it says, Then he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spoiled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So, <coughs> here Jesus is talking about, uh, both about this, this cloth, the new cloth that you cannot put on an old garment and so on, but uh, let's concentrate on the wine and the wineskins. And he is talking about that uh, there, there is new wine that is coming. Uh, he is talking about uh, that this new wine has to be put into new wineskins, or else the, the wineskins, the old wineskins, if you put new wine into old wineskins, the wine starts to expand, and since the wineskins, they are getting uh, more and more stiff, and the older they get, then they are not expandable as the new wineskins are, and, and will burst. So, and, and this is a, a perfect uh, example uh, of how the church had been operating through the ages. Uh, because when Jesus came, he came with the new wineskins. You know, uh, the, 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 the kingdom of God on, until then had been the, the Judaism, you know, uh, with the Jews and so on. And, and then Jesus coming with a total new uh, concept of, of worshiping God and how to enter into the presence of God uh, there's no longer the law that is, is uh, the, the, the guideline into how to operate with God, but now it's the grace and uh, the faith in Jesus Christ that is the new why into God. So, so, um, so this is, of course, totally new wineskins, and when we call it wineskins, we, we talk about the structure, the, 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 the order of how things are supposed to operate in the kingdom of God. So Jesus came with new wineskins, uh, and he also came with a new wine uh, in the form of the Holy Spirit, you know. The Holy Spirit is the new wine that he pours out upon all mankind, and, to, to, and, and the old rigged system could not contain that. Uh, we, we see time and time again that the people that God have filled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament are in opposition often to the, the, to the religious structure. Uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, because the, the religious structure is not expandable, it is very stiff and, and, and not uh, how the church is supposed to be when the Holy Spirit is leading the church. And, and uh, so, so in the first uh, uh, century or something like that uh, of the church history, the church was this new wineskin. And, and the Holy Spirit, you know, that had been poured out on the day of Pentecost was operating in that stru new structure that the church uh, was. And, and, uh, and they both were thriving, you know, because the new wineskins fitted the new wine that Jesus came with. But then, you know, uh, something tragic happened. Uh, these new wineskins, they start to stiffen, you know, uh, and, and 
This is something that we have seen in, in many revivals through the ages. It's like the generation that experienced revival, they are on fire for God. Then the next generation come that, uh, you know, the parents were the ones that experienced it. They are still, you know, getting the stories from their parents and they are still in, on fire, at least, but maybe a little bit not so much as their parents. But then there comes a third generation and they no longer, you know, hear the stories. The, only the very old people in the church are telling the stories and so on. And, and, uh, and then uh, we get this this, this cooling down often in, in the revivals uh, that uh, happens like uh, 40 or to 60 years after the revival. And, and then you get a, a stiff structure that is only the, uh, a, like a skeleton of the former revival. That is, is happening time and time again. You can look at every revival that has been up through the ages. It stiffens and gets stiff in a structure and there is no longer this, this ability to, to expand with the Holy Spirit's guidance. Uh, and th this is, of course, not what God wants. He wants us to, to, you know, always be filled with the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, we are supposed to be filled, and we are supposed to be a church led by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit, and, and experience the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But then, you know, uh, we need to have this, this structure that is, is, is capable of taking the Holy Spirit's life into, its, into it. Uh, and, and, of course, the tragic is that uh, often uh, when God is coming with an, a new, like, outpouring over an old system, the old system does not want it. And, and this is something that we also have seen time and time again. Uh, we saw it in the Welsh revival, uh, the, the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Wales. Uh, you know, a lot of people got saved uh, just out on the street. And then they came to the churches and the churches actually rejected it. They didn't want it. And, and, and uh, and of course, then the whole movement more or less just disintegrated. Uh, and, and, uh, and also we see it like, uh, like a more recent uh, uh, example is, is the revival in Pensacola. You know, uh, for several years, the evangelist, uh, um, um, yeah, I forgot his name. Uh, anyway, uh, an evangelist then stood there and, and was, you know, preaching the gospel, and a lot of people got saved. It's like uh, there was like a queue outside of the, that Assembly of God church. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, you know, they said that the, the prisons got more or less emptied, you know, by people getting saved and, 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 and uh, no longer doing crimes in, in that small place of Pensacola and so on. And so, so it's, it was great revival and people came from all over the world to, to visit this revival. But then, you know, after some year, the, the church actually took a vote. Do we want this to continue? Or do we, are we tired of it? And they actually voted that they, no, we don't want this anymore. So they rejected the whole thing. And that is just tragic, you know. Here God is doing something marvelous, and then the church is saying, no, we don't want it. And that is, is such a typical example of what is happening when the new wine is poured into old wineskins. Uh, and, and then the wineskins will burst after a while, and the wine will be spoiled. Okay, so, so what is these old wineskins then. It is it's a product of what the, the, the conversion of Constantine uh, came with, you know. It, it's when, when Constantine converted to Christianity in three, uh, 312 after Christ, uh, you know, after this, this battle with Maxinius and so on, uh, he, uh, he saw a cross in the sky and and say he heard a voice conquer by this sign, 
uh, and then he point, pointed, you know, this uh, cross. Actually, it was a, an X with a, like a P on, uh, standing for the first letters of Christ in the, uh, in the Greek alphabet. Um, uh, and and, and uh, so XP, um, that was, was the sign that he, he painted on the crosses, on, on the shields, I mean. Uh, and, and, um, but he, uh, anyway, he won that battle against the odds. He had a smaller army and stuff like that, uh, but he won. And he took this as a sign from God that he should convert to Christianity. And, of course, this looked like a major victory for the church. Like, and, oh, suddenly there was no more persecution. Because, because the, the former, uh, the former uh, emperor, Vespasian, he had been one of the worst persecutors. Uh, so so, so here, here was like a great change, you know, from bad persecution till religion's tolerance. So, so in 312, uh, Constantine and, and Luxius, uh, a co-emperor, co uh, made a declaration about religious tolerance. So then it was free for, for every religion to operate in within the Roman Empire. So, so, uh, so this is like, looked like a great thing. Uh, and then in 325, we have the, the, uh, the, the church meeting in uh, Nicaea. Uh, and, uh, and here Constantine is starting to, you know, influence the church with a lot of different laws. The first thing is that uh, it's no longer allowed to have house churches. House churches is abolished. So, and, and also no more private practice of religion. And that means that you have to be ordinated to be, be the one that is, is practicing religion. And he took, he, he was a former Mitras uh, uh, follower, that was a, some kind of a cult that he was following. And, and, and you can see that a lot of these things that he had in this Mitras cult, he took into Christianity uh, and, and mixed Christianity with a lot of Roman religion. And, and actually from there on, uh, the, the former uh, temples of Rome to pagan gods now certainly become a Christian shrine, you know, uh, like they call it basilicas. Uh, for instance, if you have been in Rome, the Pantheon, uh, which is, you know, uh, a place where they had all these different Roman gods and, and the gods that they had conquered and so on in the Pantheon. It's, 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 you know, that became a church. Uh, so, so it's like they Christianized a lot of these false religions, but they took some of the parts of that religion and put it into Christianity. They had former a god of harvest, now they got the saint for harvest, uh, and, and so on. There's a lot of mixture there. You can find it still in the Catholic Church. So, but the problem is that he, here there is something that is happening. And, and the goal of Constantine, when he sits there in 325 at the church meeting, is that there shall be peace and quiet in his kingdom. There shall be, you know, uh, like uh, all should, be, should agree on, on how religion is supposed to work. And, and you know, one of the th big things in, in that, um, you know, in this church meeting is, is the dispute between uh, Arenaeus and the rest of the church about who Jesus is. Is he 100% God? Is he 100% man? Or is he 100% of both as the, the majority voted on? So, and so there is like a dispute. And, and Constantine doesn't want any disputes. He wants order. And he wants control to see to it that there is order here. So therefore, he is he's no, no longer allowing this 
this, this, this organic growth that Christianity up till then have experienced through how churches, through that each and every individual in the church were operating as, you know, as a Christian, as a, as a, a preacher more or less, you know, when the, 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 the church got, this, got uh, spread because of the persecution that started in Jerusalem, they went about everywhere and preached Christ, you know. They didn't just, you know, hide or, 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 or just be quiet. No, they was preaching. That, that was how, how the church was operating in the first, first um, original church, you know. But this, this Constantine is, is afraid of. He doesn't want this. He doesn't want this, this organic, uncontrollable growth. No, he wants it being structured. He wants it to be, you know, like a formal type of church wh where we have one priest that is doing the mess and then you have a, a, a congregation that is just listening to what he is doing. And, and uh, you know, s later, you know, you get into that the priest is only preaching in Latin and so on because Latin was the only language that was like holy enough. And of course, if you then are German, or a Danish, or a Swede, or a Norwegian, you don't understand anything of what is being said. But that was also something of the concept, you know. It went from being a religion of revelation to a religion of mysticism. You know, it was only the priests and those that were, you know, el elected few, uh, those that had, you know, got the 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 um, the ability to to uh, to to do the education needed to you know learn Latin to read the Bible and so on in Latin and read all the different commentaries of the different popes and stuff like that. That was they were those that should you know practice the religion and not the main you know Christian that was sitting in the in the bench. So, so this is a, a big difference, you know. And here you see the, the, the new wineskins are being gradually shifted into being this old type of wineskins. They are getting stiffer, more structured, and, and less flexible. And, and for every time then the Holy Spirit came into this system, this, the wineskin burst, and the new revival is just being spilled out. Because there is revivals that is, is happening from time to time in, in, you know, through the ages, but still it's only very small and, and, and cannot you know, do the big difference as it's supposed to do. But then of course, uh, we can continue here. Um, then we go to Acts 3 and verse 19 which is uh, very, very important when it comes to this. And for you that have he heard me speaking about this before, um, here it comes again. Um, Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out so that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In these three verses here, we get the whole church history. Because Peter is saying that bef since, uh, since when he was preaching, there should come, you know, first, uh, you know, a time, th there should come a time of restoration, or actually it says times in plural, so times of restoration. And, and of course, in the restoration, it means that it, it is, but it's not anymore, but then it's going to be restored. 
If not, you can ha not have any restoration. That is the whole concept of restoration. So, so and, and he says, this has to happen before Jesus comes back. Everything that the holy prophets have been speaking about shall be restored and then Jesus can come back. So, okay, so that means in the early church, all that the prophets had been spoken about were operating. But then it came a time where these things were taken away. They, they you know, got shifted out by Constantine and the followers of Constantine through the ages, all up till, you know, it was total darkness, just when Luther, you know, put his, his 95 thesis on the Wittenberg door, you know, then it was, you know, you no longer got saved by faith, no, you had, you have to pay uh, a certain amount of money, you had to do a lot of things, then maybe you got saved, or at least maybe a little bit shorter time in the purgatory. So, so, so it's like, uh, the, the, the whole concept of Christianity was being taken away. So, so, so but then Jesus says there, uh, or, or Peter, I mean, is prophesying here that times of restoration will come. And this started, you know, with, with first with, with uh, Wycliffe, in John Wycliffe in, in England, and then Jan Hus in Czechia, and then Martin Luther, and, and, and all the other reformers. So, so uh, there it started, and God has been restoring truth after truth back to the church. Because he didn't do everything with Luther, that's why we are not Lutherans, <laughs> because uh, he didn't get the whole package. He got something that was extremely important, and that was the salvation through faith alone. And, and, and of course, that is the most important part. But he didn't see, for instance, that we should bless Israel and bless the Jews. No, he said, burn down the synagogues. That was Luther's point on, on, on how to do with the, with the, with the Jews. So, so, of course, there he was not biblical at all. Because the Bible says that we shall bless Israel and, and bless the Jewish people. And, and, and of course, so there he is not a man to listen to, of course. So, and, and there is a lot of things that we could use the whole night to, to take all the things that Luther didn't get right. Uh, but, but then God has, you know, taken things after things. He started to something through the Methodists, you know, the holy life. He took the baptism in, in water by full submerging. Uh, through the Baptists, and, and, and he took uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit through the Pentecostals, and he took uh, the, the healings and, and the, the restoration of, of the healing power uh, through the healing revivals in the 1940s. He took the, the miraculous through the, uh, through the charismatic movement in the 60s. He took faith through this faith movement in the 70s, he took the prophetic ministry through the prophetic um, revival in the 1980s and, and the apostolic uh, ministry through uh, the apostolic uh, revival in, in the 2000s and, and a lot of other things. So, so there is, has been times of restoration and God is taking away the thing truth by truth from those old wineskins and replacing it with new revelation. It's actually, it's not new, but it's the revelation that the, the early church had, how they were operating, and that he is placing back to the church. And, uh, <coughs> and let's go to, to um, uh, First Corinthians. I'm jumping a little bit here because I have a lot of on my heart, of course. As always, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28. There it says, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, 
after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administration, uh, various of tongues. God have appointed these in the church. And here is the point, you know. God is not restoring these different truths for that truth only, you know. It's not the, his, his end goal is not to have apostles in the church or prophets in the church or that we should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is not his own end goal, even though he had, you know, restored in, in 1901, in, in New Year Eve, when Agnes Osman got baptized in the Holy Spirit on the, on, on the Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, at Param. Then, then, of course, he started the restoration of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that was extremely important, because we are supposed to all be spirit-filled. We are all supposed to be a, a prophetic people. And, and, and of course, that is extremely important, but it's not the end goal. It didn't stop there. God did more after that. And, and of course, when he, he restored the ministry of the prophet in the 1980s, it was not just to get prophets. It was to get the church back to how the church was in the original church. When, when Paul and, and Barnabas and all the other uh, were operating, then the church had all these in place. And that is what God is doing now. He is putting back truth after truth into the church so that the church should become as it was originally and how the church is supposed to be. And we call this the fivefold church. And, and of course, that is just a name <laughs> because it, it is, you know, it's supposed to be the church. It, it, every church is supposed to be like that. And, but the problem is that we read the Bible differently from each other. Some read Acts, the book of Acts of the apostles, as a description of how it was then. Yes, we see that people are getting healed, but we don't like it. Uh, and uh, then we say, yes, it happens then, but it's not supposed to happen now. That is a, a, is a viewpoint that a lot of churches have. If you go to a Presbyterian church, or if you go to, to a, a Lutheran church, they will have this viewpoint that the book of Acts is a description of how it was then. But if you go to a Pentecostal church and ask them how they view the, uh, the book of Acts, they will say that we look at it as, as prescriptive for us. It is something that happened then, but it's also a blueprint of how we are supposed to operate. And that is the right view. Because all scripture including X, is, is useful for teaching, for equipping, for, 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 you know, that is something that we're su so supposed to build our life upon. This is, the whole book is the blueprint of how we're supposed to live. So, so if you look in Acts and see, oh, there's a prophet here. He's called Agabus. Hmm then maybe prophecies is for the New Testament. And of course they are. There's supposed to be prophets in the church. And, and, and you see there's a lot of apostles going around, and not only the 12. No, you can read a list of a lot of names that is called apostles. So, so, so uh, and, and, and that is, is how it's supposed to be. We need to read the Bible as it is, and not as we want it to be. Because then we get in trouble. And, <coughs> and you know, <coughs> so, so the main point is here, the church is supposed to be a fivefold church where all these different ministry gifts that we read about in Ephesians 4, 11, the apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and pastor 
It's supposed to be there. And, and you know, let's go to the next point here. Because we are going from one pastor to a team of ministry gifts. In, in, as I said, in, in, yeah, we can read it, in Ephesians 4.11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up all, uh, grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the eff effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth, of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Yeah, here's a lot of things, of course, but the main thing is that here we see that it's not only a pastor, because this was a product of, of um, the old wineskin way of thinking as Constantine came with. He introduced the priest into the church. This one professional that is supposed to do it all. He stands here and doing what the church is, is supposed to, you know, listen to. He is the one that preach. He is the one that do communion. He is the one that do, does everything. Actually, on the time uh, of, of John Hughes, the, John Hughes was like protesting against that it was only the priest that took communion. So, so and, 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 but of course, Communion is for the whole church. We are all supposed to be, be part of, of communion. And, and, and this, it, it, of course, if you read the Bible, you, you, you find it easily. But, but, but it, it's like they, they had gotten so corrupted, you know, by thinking we are the only ones that are invited into this. We are the only ones that are, are ordinated to do this. And we do it on behalf of the church. We are the man standing, you know, bef before them or something like that, like like a like a middleman or something like that, like a uh, some kind of negotiator for for the church. And of course, this is totally unbiblical. There's no one standing in front of you before God. Only Jesus. So 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 so. Uh, yeah, anyway. <clears throat> but we got this concept of, of the pastor. And of course, this is something that, that Luther did not deal with. He, he took this with him into the new system that came. The Lutheran church also got this priest and, and this, this ordinated person that should do the, do the, the things in front of the church. So, and, and this we have carried with us all up till now. That we have been thinking that, yeah, the pastor is doing the, the thing. He is, he is, we have paid him, so he should create revival in our town. And if, he's, if he is not succeeding in that, then we kick him out and we hire a new pastor and pay him and see if he can do it. Uh, of course, it's a little bit... Uh, put on the edge here, but, you know, that is more or less how we look at it. Uh, and, and we occasionally can have in an evangelist or maybe even a teacher, but don't speak to me about prophets and apostles. Uh, they are, of course, long gone. Um, but that you cannot find in the Bible anywhere. So, so here we, we, 
God wants us to go from this thought that Constantine gave us, that it's only these professionals that is doing church. It's not, church is not for the professionals. We are all made perfect in Christ. We are all a kingly priesthood in Christ. We are all supposed to operate in the Holy Spirit. We are all supposed to preach. We are all supposed to lay our hands on the sick and heal the sick. We are all supposed to do the things that Jesus did and greater things. That is what church is about. And, and these five gifts are given to the church, not as individuals, but as a collective, as a team that is fulfilling each other. The, the evangelists and the prophets are very unlike each other. You know, they, they are not the same. They are operating very differently, but we need them both. And, and because they are fulfilling different parts of what Jesus gave to the church. And, and therefore, we need them all to get the whole picture of what God is giving to the church. Okay. Uh, so, so we go from one pastor to a team of ministers. Uh, and, and, uh, and the whole point is to get to what we'll read about in, in 1 Corinthians 14. So we can go there. 1 Corinthians 14. And verse 26. 26. And uh, of course you, you can read the, the other verses, but uh, I do not take time now to, to read them because um, this is more like, more or less like a, like a, uh, you know, like a foundation. Oh, uh, I'm just going to get me some paper here. So, sorry. Such a bright light up here, so I get a little bit so problem with my eyes. <coughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, let's go to First Corinthians fourteen and verse twenty-six. How is it then, brethren? Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a something? This is how church was when Paul is writing to the Corinthians. This is how church was operating in the beginning. They all came with something. Not only the preacher, yeah, the, the, the were some very ministry gifts there, but they were there to equip the saints into the work of ministry. They were there to help the church coming into function. And that is, is the whole point with this kind of teaching, with, the, with this type of church, is that the church as a collective body shall be in function. And... and when we call, talk about function, it doesn't mean that, uh, that, yes, we have the whole church in function because we have put them on the wash list. They are washing the floors each once each week. Uh, that is, of course, marvelous that somebody is washing your floors. But that is not the church in function. When we talk about the church in function, we're talking about spiritual ministry. We are all supposed to operate in the spiritual gifts. We are all supposed to preach the gospel. We are all supposed to heal the sick. We are all supposed to operate in the, the same deeds that Jesus did. That is the church in function. 
Yes, we can have practical gifts and, and ministries and so on. No problem. But that is not your excuse to just leave them in the benches, you know. Leave them to, yes, you can wash the windows, you can wash the doors, you can wash the toilets. That is not the church in function. The church in function is the church operating in the city, in your, in, in your area, as those that goes out and preaching Christ. That is the church in function. We have hide it behind that, yes, we do these practical things. Yes, somebody is standing in the cafeteria, and somebody is, you know, doing stuff. But, and that is good. Of course, we need these things. But we are all. You know, Mark 16 says, these are the signs of those who believe. They cast out demons, they heal the sick, and even if they drink something poisonous, it shall not harm them, and so on. You can read it by yourself. And, and uh, put a mark on everything that you ha are doing. Okay. Uh, so the whole church in function, that is the point. Let's continue here, because now I'm getting into something that is very interesting. Let's go to 2 Kings. Or two kings, I think maybe you are saying in, in, in English. Second Kings and, and chapter 2 and uh, verse 18. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Okay, this is, of course, in the end of, of another story. But I just took this, this verse also to, to say that this is happening in Jericho. And that is a very big point here. Uh, so, and then we can t continue uh, in verse 19. Then the, man of the, then the man of the city said to Elijah, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt, cast in the salt there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water, from it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, uh, which he spoke. Okay. Here we have a very interesting story. In, in, uh, in, uh, if you will read in, in, in Joshua uh, chapter 6, you find that Joshua actually cursed the city of Jericho. He, 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 uh, he, he uh, uh, said that uh, this land shall be cursed, and he also said that uh, the, f the man that is, is b rebuilding Jericho, his uh, oldest son shall die when he puts down the foundation, and his younger son shall die when he puts up the gates. So, so there was a curse here. And, and even though here the, the city has been rebuilt, and if you, you can read in, in uh, I think it's in this uh, book of Samuel or in the first Kings, you see that the man that actually did this, he, he got these losses that, uh, that uh, Joshua was, you know, pronouncing. But anyway, Jericho has been rebuilt, but the curse is there. The, this, the water is, is foul. It is, 
contaminated. So it only brings death and barrenness. And the land is barren. So, so, so it, it, even though it, as the, the, city, the, the citizen of the city says, it, the city is, is located on a very nice place. But the land is barren because the water is full. And, and, and then uh, we see something here. Because when, when we look at our cities, there is a stream in our, com in our cities also. Uh, and, and just as in Jericho, it might bring death and barrenness. There is like a, uh, uh, we can jo go to uh, Jeremiah 2, uh, and there we find a reference to this. Jeremiah 2. And verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and heaven themselves uh, cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So there is in, in the worldly system, you know, when they turn away from God, then they get a well that is, is contaminated. It's a broken well where, where, you know, dirt and stuff gets into the water. And, and when you are drinking this water, you get death and destruction as a fruit. And of course, in, 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 the, um, in our cities, you know, where, where people are not Christians, uh, they, they are not, you know, aware of this. They, they are more or less, you know, unaware of that the, the, the streams that they are drinking from will only produce death and destruction in them. And, and of course, this is a figurative s stream. Of course, it's not, you know, the water that is the problem, you know. This I got from the, from the tap here. It's, it's, it's clean enough, hopefully. Um, uh, of course, in some places, you cannot drink the water from the, from the tap. But, uh, yeah, that is not what God is talking about here. He's not talking about literal water. He's talking about there is a stream in the spirit. It's, it's a stream, the, 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 anti, the spirit of Antichrist, you know, is working in, in the society. And this is, is producing death and destruction and barrenness in the land, in our cities, where we live, you know. We see it day out and day in. We see youth going into depression and so on. We see families split up. We see drug addicts and we see violence and stuff like that. It's all because they are drinking from the wrong well. They are drinking this destructive well from the spirit of the Antichrist. So, so and this, this stream is there. And when we reject God, then we start to drink from this well instead. And this well is cursed. And in here in Jericho, the well, the, the stream in the city was cursed, and it only bring, uh, gave them death and barrenness. But then, you know, uh, let's continue here. Because God, God's people, you know, we are called to be the, 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 the fixer of this. We are supposed to, to do just as the prophet Elisha here did. He, you know, he did something with this stream that made it pure. And let's go to, Ma to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Uh, 
when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, uh, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and, and others uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, this is, uh, of course, a, a very, very interesting story, and, and we could take a lot of time of explaining this, but, of course, here the, the revelation of whom Jesus is, is the rock. It's not Peter that is the rock. Yeah, but if we, the church is supposed to be built upon the revelation of whom Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. He's not one of the prophets, he's not Elisha, he's not uh, uh, any of these other, uh, John the Baptist or, or whomever they, they have, of, but he is the Son of God. And, and, and that is the revelation that the church is supposed to be built on. But here, the main thing is the word that Jesus uses to say, my church. He says, my ecclesia. And ecclesia wasn't, of course, a <laughs> common word in that time, but it was a very special word. And it was pointing to a certain assembly of men, a, 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 a group called out from a city to govern the city. Like, you know, like a, a, like a, 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 a group of politicians, maybe like, like that, we have here, uh, like, a, 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 like a, count, a city council or something like that, uh, might be a good word for it. So they were, the, the meaning of the word ecclesia means a group called out to be ruling a city. So, so, and that is very, very interesting when Jesus is saying, I will build this. This is my church. This is how the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be here to rule the area where they are. And that is also, you know, he is continuing saying to Peter that I will give you the keys and you shall, whatever you lose in heaven shall be loosed. In the, whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And, and again, this is about the use of authority. And of course, let's also read in, uh, just uh, what not a verse in, in Revelation, because here we could read a lot of verse about that we are supposed to operate in authority. And we read from Revelation 5 and verse 8. And it says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamp, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are sl were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. That is what Jesus is expecting of his church. He's saying, I am building my ecclesia. I'm building my church. And of course, we have a totally different, you know, picture in our minds when we are talking about church. Because we have, you know, been living in this, this, this concept, which is not what 
Jesus had in mind when he said, I will build my church. He had something totally different in his mind. We are seeing, we are maybe when we are thinking about church, we are looking at, we are thinking about a building, you know. The building is the church. That is, of course, totally off. The building has nothing to do with the church. But, uh, and, and, and we are thinking about, yeah, uh, it might be we are sitting here and, uh, and we are listening to a preacher, and that is church. Yes, it might be some of it. It's definitely not all. But what Jesus had in mind when he said, I will build my ecclesia, he had what this word was containing. He did not take a total random word no, he took this word, and it means an assembly that is set to rule, an assembly that should have authority, that should influence the area where they are operating. That is what church is about. We are supposed to operate as a, a, a body, as Jesus' body on the earth. And we are here to manifest his will on earth. Just as we pray, you know. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the whole point. His will is supposed to be looked at on the earth. His will is supposed to be manifested here on earth through the church. That is what Ecclesia is about. And of course, let's go back to 2 to, to, uh, um, Kings uh, and, and uh, read, read it once more there. Because uh, now we have this in, in mind, you know, that we are supposed to be the ecclesia, a ruling body on the earth. So, so, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19. Then the man of the city said to Elijah, Please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as the Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, Bring to me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Okay, a new bowl. Why on earth is Elisha here saying, bring me a new bowl? Should that matter, you know? You can bring salt in a, in a very old bowl also. As long as it is clean and, and not filled with water, the salt will, you know, function just as fine in an old bowl. No, he says, very specific, give me a new bowl. And fill it with salt. Okay. We are, you know, in Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16, it says, Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth. We as Christians, we are the salt. And here, Elisha is saying, bring me a bowl, a new bowl with salt in. And, and what is this? It is another picture of the new wineskins. Because the wineskins contain the, 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 the new wine, which is the Holy Spirit in us. And the wineskins is the church, the structure of the church, how the church is, is operating and so on. And again, we are the salt. We, each Christian, is the salt of the earth. And here, the bowl is the one that is containing it. Again, it is the church. And it's supposed to be the new type of church. The new church type that Jesus came with. The new type of church that God is restoring now. Because the old type of church is not letting the salt be salt. When Constantine came, and removed, you know, the, the private practices of Christianity. 
He abolished it. He said it's now illegal to do it. Everyone that is supposed to be Christian shall come to my church, listen to my preach, and sit there and be quiet. But that is not the church that Jesus started. The church that Jesus started went all around preaching the gospel. They were trained by the, pre by the, the ministers to do the work of ministry. That was the whole point. But Constantine took away the sole power of the church and gave it only to one priest. So it was like the church of Constantine was an old bowl filled with only one salt grain. You know, you know <laughs> picture this, you are sitting at dinner uh, and uh, you think the, the food is a little bit not too salty, not salty enough. So you ask me to send you the salt and I take one salt grain and give it to you. Uh, are you then satisfied? Of course not. And that is also how the Church of Constantine is operating. It is operating like one guy have all the salt and they are the ones that we are salting every time. I'm giving my salt to you and taking it back and I give it to you. And, and that is, is, of course, not how church is supposed to be. We are all supposed to be salt. We are all supposed to be in this new bowl that is getting us into function. And that is, is a very, very good picture of how this was. And, you know, in Ephesians 3, And then you are thinking, oh, but what about my church? This is not operating like this. No, then it should be repent. It should get in line with what God is doing in this age. What God is doing, he is restoring the church back to its original. And those that don't want to go with God will face the consequences. That is how it is, church. Grow up. Get in line with what God is doing at this age. Because the age that we are entering into is an age of the wolves. And he is sending us out as lambs among wolves. And we better get ready. Because the times will get harder and harder. But the church is supposed to get more and more glorious. But then we need to let his will be done, not ours. Okay. In Ephesians 3, I just felt that came, so I just gave it to you that was sitting in thinking of that. Ephesians 3 and verse 18 may be able to comprehend with all the saints that is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Often we read the two last verses there and, you know, get very satisfied by reading them. But here it said something here in verse 18. And it said, that, let me see, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. So all the saints. There's a, there's a, you know, uh, 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 there, there, is, there is something that is needed here for us to get into the two last verses there where we are filled to the whole fullness of God and see the, his 
doing exceedingly, abundantly, above, more, and, you know, the whole shebang there. Uh, but there is something that goes before that, and that is together with all the saints. We only get that when the whole body of Christ is getting into function. Because I, as a preacher, cannot come with the fullness of God. I only have the part that he has given me. And then uh, we have maybe a teacher in the church, he is giving his part. And then we have a prophet, and he's giving his part. And then we have an evangelist that just gives his part, and a pastor, and so on. But still, it's not enough. We need all the saints coming with what God has given them. And then we get to see the full picture. We get to see the width, the length, the, the, the depth, and so on. And through that, we get filled to the fullness of God. And that is what God is starting, you know. He's, he's rising up his church so that he can come with his fullness of glory upon his church in the latter days. And as you know, it says in Isaiah 60 verse 1 till 7 that when, the, when darkness, when complete darkness is, is over the earth, then you shall rise and shine. And that is, you know, what the church of God is supposed to do in the latter days. We are here to shine brighter than ever before. We are here to shine hope. We are here to shine and, and you know, show them the glory of God so that the knowledge of the glory of God can fill the earth as the water fills the sea, as it says. And, and you know, that is how we're supposed to be. But then we need the church into function. And you know, if you read in Acts 11, for instance, you will see that it was not just the apostles that went about and preached the gospel. In the church of Antioch, it started by some men coming to Antioch, uh, men from Cyprus and from Kyrenes, uh, and, and, uh, and they preached the gospel. And a lot of, of, of Greek people got saved. And, and, and then they heard about it in, in Jerusalem and sent Barnabas there. But it started with ordinary people. And when Paul is, came, is coming to Ephesus, he is not going around in all Ephesus and preaching the gospel. No, he sits in the school of Tyrannus and he is preaching the gospel. He is, he is teaching the, the new converted people into becoming Christians. That, and Christians means small Christ, Christ-like person. And then they went about and they evangelized the whole, you know, province of Asia Minor in two and a half years. So, so this is, is how God wants church to be, that the ministry gifts are here to equip the saints, and then the saints are going out and preach the gospel. And of course, let's go back again to 2 Kings, where we are um, in chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse, um, verse 21. So here he has gotten, you know, this, this bowl of new salt. Uh, no, new bowl of salt, I mean. Uh, then it says, Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from it. Uh, from it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained, remains healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, uh, which he spoke. Okay, so here we see it's not enough just to have this new type of church, this new type of thinking when it comes to church, and, and you know, this new bowl of salt. 
No, you need to spread the salt into the source of the water. And what is this water? It's, you know, the streams that are in the, in the society, the streams that are in the city, the streams that is, is bringing death and destruction and barrenness to the city. There we are supposed to throw the salt in. And what is the salt? It's you and me. We are the salt of the earth. We are supposed to be there. Here in, in Sanes, we have uh, uh, like a place uh, where, uh, where all the buses and the trains are, you know, gathering, the, the bus station. And there in the, in the weekends, it's like total craziness. It's like young children going around, people get s selling drugs, and there is violence and stuff like that. That is a source of death and destruction in this city. That is a place where we are supposed to be salted. We are supposed to be there. We as Christians, we are so afraid often. We, we get a fine building and, and we are hiding inside there. And we are, you know, yeah, let's look here how it is blowing and, and thundering outside. Oh, poor people that are outside our building. But here, mm, here it's so warm and cozy. That is the concept that we have of church. And it is, of course, total rubbish. It's so unchristian as it can be. We are not supposed to hide. We are not supposed to just be in our cozy little small church having, yeah, tonight we're going to have Christmas dinner for us, the few elect. That is, what is this? This is not church. This is selfishness put in system. And we need to take the whole concept and kick it out the door. We need to get Christian, get saved, and get in function. We need to get out into the, the streets where people is hurting into the families where people are is hurting, into the, the, into the hospitals where people is hurting. There is where we are supposed to be Christians. We are supposed to be the light of the world. We are supposed to be the salt of this earth. And if you are just staying in here, there is no function to us. And of course, when we come out there, we are not, you know, if you read Ezekiel 37, you know, Ezekiel is taken by the Spirit and placed into a valley full of bones, you know. And, you know, you can describe the bones. Oh, yeah, there are so many bones here. It's like they are so dead. And we can write a big essay about how dead these bones are. And that is often what we are doing, you know. When we, got, you know, finally get out, in the street, get out among people, then we say, oh, oh, they are so sinning. There's so much sin and destruction here. And we, you know, we come back bringing report, you know, and we talk for hours about how bad this earth is, how bad the people is, how corrupted and foul and everything, you know. And, and we talk for lengths about the, the, you know, the worldly system is a corrupted system. And what we are doing, we are just cursing it more and more. What you say is what you get. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we are cursing our cities day out and day in. But what did the prophet Ezekiel do when he was in this valley full of bones? He listened to the word of God. And God said, can these bones live? And then he said, I don't know, but you know. And then God is saying to him, prophesy to the dead bones. Get together. Find it's your place. 
get no meat and scenes and, and, and skin and stuff. And they did, you know, because he's prophesying to the bones. And what is Elisha doing here? He is taking the salt into the, the source of the water, into the, into the stream, and he is prophesying what God is saying. And he says, in verse 22, no, actually 21, Thus says the Lord, this is what Elisha is saying. He is listening to what God is saying to the stream. And he, God is saying, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. And that is what we as church is supposed to do. We have been given the authority to bind on earth and to lose on earth. We are here to be ruling with Christ. Romans 5 verse 17. Every Christian that have been given the gift of grace and the gift of righteousness, that is every Christian, isn't it? Or are you a Christian that have not been given the gift of grace or Righteousness, and so in, if, if that is the matter, then you have to get saved, my little friend. Because then you are not saved. So every Christian is being given this gift. And what does it say? Then you shall rule with Christ. You are being given the authority to rule in your city. You are supposed to go down to the bus station among the youth, and you s start to bless this place. And you say, this stream is no longer going to give death and destruction to the youth. Here is going to be life and life in abundance. We are supposed to speak to the mountain and the mountain shall move. And we need to start to do this in the, all these places where death and destruction is coming from. Go to... To the, to, to, the, to the pubs, to the, uh, to the clubs, to the porn uh, boutiques and whatever. Uh, and, and go in there and speak the word from God. And say what is supposed to be here. So when you come into a pub, you shall start to bless and say, here is going to be a marvelous restaurant in Jesus' name. People is going to be fed with, with food created with, with love and care. There is no longer going to be a place of destruction and, and uh, corruption. You are supposed to speak. You have to listen to what God is saying about this place and start speaking it. Because... As it said here in verse 22. So the water remains sealed to this day. According to the word of Elisha which he spoke. What is the, spirit of, the sword of the spirit in Ephesians 6? It is the spoken word of God. When we speak the word, we are putting the sword of the Spirit into use. It doesn't help if you, you know, sneak into the pub and thinking it, you know. No, you have to declare it. You have to use your mouth and speak it loud so that everyone hears it and the spirit of death that is there have to flee. You are the ecclesia of God. You are the bowl of salt, the new bowl of salt that God has given to this earth so that we shall stop the corruption, so that we shall stop the, the, the rottenness, so that we shall stop the death and barrenness and instead bring life and fruitfulness. That is 
our job as the Christian church. Okay. I think we stopped there. I had a lot of more, but you can listen to the different uh, teaching that we have had on the Firefall Conference, and you will find much more of this. So, Father, I just pray for each and every one of them that have listened. I just pray that you come with your Holy Spirit and let the Word just be planted in their hearts and let it grow and bring fruit in Jesus' name. And I pray for each pastor and leader that has listened to this. Come with your conviction and, and give them revelation about how the church is supposed to operate in their city so that they can be the ecclesia, the, the church that you wanted it to be. And, and let them get, take the authority that you have given them and start using it so that they can change the stream of their city. And we can see that the cities are no longer just, you know, barren and dead. Instead, there's going to be life and life in abundance in Jesus' name. So, Father, we just pray your anointing upon them, each and every one, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, God bless you, and I hope you got something from this, and uh, see you next week. Amen.